Hi and welcome back to Free Science Lessons. By the end of this video you should be able to describe the events taking place during the action potential. You should then be able to describe what's meant by the all or nothing principle. In previous videos we looked at the resting potential and at receptors and if you haven't seen those videos then you need to watch them now. I'm going to link those videos in the description below and I'm going to assume that you've watched them. Remember that when a neuron is not transmitting an impulse, the inside of the axon membrane has a negative charge compared with the outside. This is called the resting potential, and this has a value of around minus 65 millivolts. We also have a higher concentration of sodium ions outside the axon than the inside, and we have a higher concentration of potassium ions inside the axon than outside. Remember that the axon membrane contains a protein called the sodium potassium pump. Using energy from ATP, the sodium potassium pump actively transports sodium ions out of the axon and potassium ions into the axon. For every three sodium ions transported out, only two potassium ions are transported in. We've also seen that the membrane contains ion channels for sodium ions and potassium ions. These channels allow the ions to diffuse down their concentration gradients by facilitated diffusion. However, the rate of diffusion of potassium ions is greater than for sodium ions. OK, so in this video, we're looking at what happens when the axon membrane transmits an impulse. We're going to see how an impulse is transmitted in response to a stimulus being detected by a receptor. For example, when pressure is detected by a Pacinian corpuscle. OK, I'm showing you here a section of the axon membrane. I'm also showing you the potential difference across the membrane. Now, a key idea you need to understand is that, as well as the ion channels we've already seen, the membrane also contains voltage-gated ion channels. Voltage-gated ion channels only open when the membrane potential reaches a certain value. So you can see that we have voltage-gated sodium ion channels and voltage-gated potassium ion channels. OK, so at the start, the neuron is not transmitting an impulse, and the membrane is at the resting potential of minus 65 millivolts. The receptor now detects a stimulus. The energy of the stimulus triggers voltage-gated sodium ion channels to open. Sodium ions now rapidly diffuse into the axon down their electrochemical gradient. This causes the inside of the axon to become less negative. This change in voltage now triggers more voltage-gated sodium ion channels to open, allowing more sodium ions to diffuse into the axon. And scientists say that this is an example of positive feedback. As more and more sodium ions diffuse into the axon, the membrane depolarizes. The inside of the membrane reaches a potential of plus 40 millivolts. So as you can see, during the action potential, the membrane potential switches from minus 65 millivolts to plus 40 millivolts. When the membrane potential reaches around plus 40 millivolts, this triggers the voltage-gated sodium ion channels to close and the voltage-gated potassium ion channels to open. Now sodium ions stop diffusing into the axon and potassium ions now diffuse out of the axon down their electrochemical gradient. As potassium ions diffuse out, the inside of the axon switches from positive to negative, and scientists call this repolarization. Now, because a large amount of potassium ions diffuse out of the axon, the inside of the axon actually becomes more negative than the resting potential. This is called hyperpolarization. At this point, the voltage gated potassium ion channels close. The resting potential is now restored as the sodium potassium pump pumps sodium ions out of the axon and potassium ions into the axon. Now, there is a final key idea you need to understand. This is called the all or nothing principle, and there are two parts to this. Firstly, an action potential is only generated if the stimulus is greater than a certain threshold. If this stimulus is below the threshold, then no action potential is generated, and we can see that with the graph I'm showing you here. In this case, the stimulus is too weak to exceed the threshold and generate an action potential. However, if the stimulus is greater than the threshold, then an action potential is generated. 
So in this graph, the stimulus has exceeded the threshold and generated an action potential. Secondly, the size of the action potential does not depend on the strength of the stimulus. As long as the threshold is exceeded, then a stronger stimulus will produce the same size action potential as a weaker stimulus. This graph shows a stronger stimulus, and you can see that the size of the action potential has not changed. However, a stronger stimulus produces a greater frequency of action potentials than a weaker stimulus. In other words, a stronger stimulus will trigger more action potentials per second than a weaker stimulus. This graph shows a very strong stimulus, and this is producing a high frequency of action potentials. In the next video, we look at how an action potential is propagated along an axon.